outrageously gruesome, deadly, and devious. These are some of the characteristics of people who you may come across as we bring to you these real life crime stories. I want to welcome you to the very first episode of our true crime podcast called Mayhem. My name is John Andrado. I will be your host as we pull out these chaotic stories one after another. I am not going to waste any time. Today, we are diving headfirst into a bone chilling story that unfolds in the heart of Mataiko, right here in Accra, a community with a rich history and fascinating transformation. Now, I want you to picture this Mataiko. It used to be a little village with deep-rooted traditions and now stands as a busy suburb in Accra. Over time, it has attracted people from all walks of life seeking better opportunities in this dynamic city. Traditional roots and modern urban living blend seamlessly in this vibrant neighborhood, giving it a unique character. But wait, things are about to take a seriously dark turn. The story of Charles Papa Kwabena Ebukwansa, also known as the Accra Strangler. This guy earned quite a reputation in 2000 when he was arrested and later convicted for the horrifying strangulation of not one, not two, but nine innocent women. He was born in 1964 and could be described as having had a troubled past and it seemed like he just couldn't stay away from crime. He had quite an extensive criminal history, including a previous conviction for rape in 1986, for which he served time in James Fort Prison. After his release, he committed another rape and served three years at Intawan Prisons in 1987. While in prison, he learned carpentry and secured a job in Kumase. In 1996, he was imprisoned again for robbery and later relocated to Accra upon his release. Now, after serving time for previous convictions, he started his carpentry craft in Kumasi, but his violent tendencies always returned and this led him down a sinister path which would leave a trail of death and devastation. Now, Kwanzaa's case would gain major attention when he was arrested for the murder of his girlfriend who was named Joyce Boating. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. Soon, another woman's murder was linked to him and this sent shockwaves of outrage and demands for justice and accountability from the authorities. But it gets crazier. If you can believe it, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI of the United States of America, jumped into this investigation to aid the Ghana Police Service in an effort to try to pin this man down. Admittedly, there was a lack of physical evidence, but they were able to start piecing a few things together and one of these elements would be a bloody t-shirt which would end up playing a very crucial role in tying Kwanzaa to these crime scenes. And get this, he even said the spirits made him commit these terrible acts. Now, as Kwanzaa's trial unfolded in 2002, horrifying details of his crimes would further come into light. His victims were often food sellers or sex workers, and the killings involved rape, strangulation, and even mutilation. That is very extreme. Now, despite being convicted and sentenced to be hanged, Kwanzaa maintained his innocence, claiming torture during police custody. He filed appeals and lost them, and he kept insisting he didn't do it. He even sought support from a pen pal in Holland, adding another twist to this already twisted tale. And 21 years after the unfolding of this case, he is still serving time at Insanwam prison. Now, a couple of things stuck out to me when I was reading the facts of this case. The first of which, which I was really not expecting, was his previous convictions for rape and more so the duration of the sentences he served. First, he would serve barely a year and then would serve three years, which, if I remember correctly from my legal education, Act 29, that's the Criminal Offenses Act of Ghana, 1960, in Section 97 and 98, I believe, speaks on rape. And I believe it's classified as a first-degree felony 
which is liable to a term of not less than five years, but no more than 25 years. I could be wrong and I am not above correction in this instance. However, anyone who would compare the facts of this to what the law says would instantly point to a broken justice system. And I've read as much as I can, but I can't seem to tie any plausible reason to why he was let go of that quickly, especially when you are a repeat offender for the same offense, coupled with robbery, which would land him in Sawan prison, which would lead him to becoming a carpenter. And then the fact that the FBI of all entities would jump on a case like this in another jurisdiction is, it's, it's unfathomable. I, I cannot think of too many cases throughout history where the FBI has had to jump in and help a police service. It is mind-boggling, and especially considering the time. This was in the 90s. You know, in the course of researching this particular case, along with my producer, Jeffa McCaffrey, who has been very, very instrumental in piecing everything together, I would ask a lot of people that I know, does the name Charles Kwanzaa ring a bell? Does it sound familiar to you? And almost every time, the first answer I would get is, oh, the guy that kept killing the women. And I found that very frightening in the sense that the murders he committed happened within a seven year span. Taking one life in of itself is one thing. Taking nine is another. And I was reading and it, it broke my heart to know that some of these women were mothers and you have completely altered the trajectory of a child's life because you took their mother away from them for to, to fulfill your bloodlust almost. And it is frightening to even think about the fact that there were 34 different murders and he confessed to nine of them and people still doubted and said, oh, he probably was responsible for all 34. Which, mind you, an admission which I would find very contradictory to what he said about the spirits leading him to do it only to lay that plea that he didn't do it at all. He was a very troubled and confused man. Is, I should say. The man is 59 years old, still serving time in Asawam, as we have established earlier. And then him having a pen pal outside Ghana. For some reason, this screams escape plan to me. He wanted to jackpot and run. And thank God that did not materialize because who knows what would have happened. The families deserve justice. And it's been 21 years. But the trauma his actions have caused i i feel i feel so much for the families i feel so much for them because not only do you have to learn that your loved one was taken away in such a brutal manner they met the end of their life at the hands of such a diabolical being but you know dealing with the loss and then having to go to court back and forth potentially looking at this man in, in all his antics. I truly hope that the relatives of these victims have found peace all these years later because these are wounds that will not go away anytime soon. Death is one thing, but for it to occur in such a manner is it's heart-wrenching. I am going to leave it right here. Thank you so much for listening to the very first episode of this podcast mayhem which i hope becomes your go-to podcast for everything true crime make sure to subscribe and follow us on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify audio mac wherever you get your podcasts we will be available till you hear my voice again in another episode please stay safe keep your doors locked never stop seeking the truth in the mysteries of this world my name is john andrado and this is mayhem